I'm Peter Murray, uh, Chairman of NLA, and I'm uh, chairing this uh, session at lunchtime today. And this uh, uh, event is, as you might expect, related to our exhibition here about streets ahead, about the way that uh, we use our streets. And uh, so really good to have our first speaker, Charlie Palmer, who's actually now been around to look at streets around the world on a fascinating voyage. And I'm really looking to uh, hear what he has to say. And uh, uh, you know, this exhibition shows what London's doing and the sort of things we might do. And people are here actively voting for um, uh, all these excellent things, of which one of the, we, sorry, we've run out of buttons. So many people want to vote. And the best one, I think, is that we're, uh, everyone is voting for um, a car-free uh, days like they had in Paris uh, a few months ago, which uh, I hope that we can get the mayoral candidates to support the idea of. Uh, we do tend to, we close off Oxford Street every now and then and uh, Regent Street, but only for other events, not just so that we can actually enjoy the streets uh, as uh, places in the city. So we hope uh, some of these things that are proposed here will uh, come out of uh, this exhibition and the whole debate which we want to involve our mayoral candidates in. But uh, uh, key amongst those is to uh, improve uh, uh, conditions for cycling and walking and active travel. So to tell us about his experience of uh, going round the world, uh, Charlie. Hello everyone. Hi, I'm Charlie Palmer, the winner of the 2015 Norman Foster Travelling Scholarship, which is an award given to a student of architecture once a year to support a period of travel and research uh, that can challenge the way that we think about the built environment and the profession of architects, urban designers and designers in general. I won the award for my proposal, Cycling Megacities, uh, which is a research project to travel to 10 megacities in five developing countries. I went to Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Dhaka, Calcutta, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, amongst others. Um, in each city, I met up with architects, city planners, urban designers, cycling activists, and everyday cyclists to understand what is happening culturally, socially, and physically with regards to cycling. I chose to go to these places so that I could study the sustainable movement of the most rapidly increasing urban populations on the planet. Um, so instead of specifically talking about my experiences, I'm going to talk um, about how they're relevant to the development of London today. Unsurprisingly, going to developing megacities um, made, it feel, made my, me feel privileged. Um, coming from a country where mobility is often taken for granted and is increasingly separated from issues such as gender equality and um, social class. But despite this privileged position, cycling in British cities is often um, feeling equally unsafe, if not more uh, dangerous, than cycling in other places around the planet. So cycling in, on the streets of Calcutta in India, for example, or the avenues of Mexico City, I felt more relaxed in these places than I, than I do on a daily basis here. So why is this? Calcutta is a chaotic city, and the streets are where we're, are the stage of all this activity. The streets there are completely different from our lane-based, divided and managed road system. They are shared, flowing environments, uncontrolled yet self-managed. While this feels safer than the lane-based system we have here is not only due to the same rhetoric that we hear all the time, that slow traffic in shared spaces leads to safer environments for cycling and walking in. It feels safer because on every street, wherever you are in the city, there is a cyclist, there is someone on a bike, and it makes you feel that there is space for people on two wheels on any street in any part of the city. So my first point would be that if you want London to feel like a safe place to cycle in, the quiet ways should be on every minor road, and the so-called superhighways should be every arterial route. It is the idea that the cycle path network should be the street network, and in such a way that, like Copenhagen, um, the streets could, could be categorised from one to four, one being shared, four being 
uh, having a segregated cycle lane. As I was traveling, I asked people whether they felt cycling around the cities they lived in. Most of them unsurprisingly said no. However, in Sao Paulo and Mexico City, the majority of these people said they do feel safe, and this is going back to this voting box here, uh, that on every Sunday is when they feel safe. That every Sunday there's the weekend road closures, and um, parts of the city are completely closed, or parts of the road system are closed to traffic, creating miles of space for people to cycle, walk, run, play in. And this has started to completely transform the way people feel about the roads in their cities. Imagine weekends in London where the empty roads around Bank or Holborn um, could be filled with people having a good time, getting fitter, but most importantly, providing a space for people to feel safe on the streets of London. The perception of cycling in London is not only that it isn't safe, it is that being a cyclist in London is to be a criminal. Cyclists go through red lights, it is a fact. And it is an ever-increasing ever one with ASL zones not providing adequate space with an increased number of people cycling. But there are other laws like it being illegal to enter an ASL from the outside, yet it being illegal uh, to undertake moving vehicles. So from a legal standpoint, cyclists are for forced to be in the wrong because the laws do not match up with the infrastructure. So when I was in Mexico City, new laws rewriting governing policies in cycling and walking were introduced. In this new legislation, it has become legal for cyclists to go through red lights on minor junctions. This not only reinforces the rightful priority in favor of more vulnerable road users, it means that the actions cyclists usually take are now legally accepted. In Paris, they have followed this route and have started to install signs allowing um, uh, to go right at certain junctions or straight on when it is safe to do so. Um, but while I might not totally agree with the Mexico City approach, um, the laws governing road use in London desperately need re-examining. One of the major problems traffic planners face, though, um, in London especially, is that people are impatient and will rarely re wait for longer than 45 seconds to cross the road. If a law allowed uh, safe left turns at crossroads or pass-throughs at T-junctions, the timing issue often seen at newly planned junctions could greatly diminish and would pave the way for a forward-thinking future. So the issue of speed and movement is an ever-increasing factor in how we move through the cities we live in. While we individually be have begun to expect to quickly move from A to B, it is only a result of traffic planners increasing the flow of large numbers of people. But it wasn't until I visited Guangzhou and saw the third phase of the ra bus rapid transport system there, which currently carries over 30,000 people per hour, that I truly understood this priority. To ease this flow, one of the largest bicycle share systems in the world has been put in place along this 20-kilometer route. Unlike the Boris bikes, which are strategically placed away from major transport hubs, the Guangzhou bicycle share system allows for a multimodal journey from home to work. People cycle to a station where they get on a bus and then they get back onto the bicycle share system to get to work. This speeds up journey times and provides wider reaching, wider reaches for existing public transport hubs. While I understand that the strategy behind the placement of Boris bikes is aimed at increasing multiple daily uses per bike and therefore reduces the number of bikes needing relocating at the end of the day, it is now established and could be re-examined enough so that we can start to facilitate a multimodal culture of getting to work. Why aren't there thousands of bikes waiting at Paddington Station or King's Cross or Victoria or London Bridge? Furthermore, the mini Holland scheme should be less about making suburbs feel like cycle-friendly Dutch towns and instead should promote this multimodal approach to getting to local train stations. 
as also promoted by the Mexico City authorities who see a future of people cycling to their local train station, getting on a train, getting into the city, and then using the same travel card um, to get out a bicycle share bike and get to work. It needs to be seamless and therefore combined. So to round up, I've created a list of six points that I believe a cycling megacity requires. Firstly, have a multimodal commu commuting strategy, which not only increases flow, but also reduces demand on public transport systems. Secondly, have a cheap bicycle share system, which is integrated with these transport hubs. Thirdly, have, a clear road, have clear road rules not, not, that not only prioritize pedestrians and cyclists, but clearly facilitate a safe yet forward-thinking approach to behavior at junctions. Have weekend road closures for growth of cycling and other healthy and sociable activities. And then my last two are about infrastructure. Provide safe and segregated secure bicycle infrastructure on all major arterial routes. And then between these, have capillary shortcuts just for pedestrians and cyclists, which join the tr main transport hubs. Thank you. Right, so we're now going to have uh, a bit of uh, Q&A with uh, Charlie. So uh, you stay up here, Charlie. And uh, we've uh, got a mic, where we've got a spare microphone, which is going to go around. Um, I, I hadn't realised what you were going to talk about in terms of the things, but it chimes really well with some of the things we've got here, and I think is going to chime quite well with our, our uh, second speaker as well. So that we, it's very good that we're sort of going in the right sort of direction, I think, in thinking about cycling. So any, anyone like to uh, start off uh, uh, qu uh, commenting on uh, points that Charlie's made? Yeah? Yeah, Okay. Is about, oh, my question is regarding um, cyclists going through red lights and how, how at the moment we're seen as, or cyclists are seen as being in the wrong. Um, I, on my route to work, I've been doing the same route for about seven years and I've always seen an increase in the amount of traffic lights. So infrastructure planners are putting in more traffic lights rather than removing them. So it means that you're being penalised more often. And I wonder whether there's a way in which we could design our junctions to design out traffic lights. So rather than worrying about the law, if you, don't, if you have give way, then surely uh, it's a, it becomes a lot more of a behavioural and uh, respectful system rather than people were being coloured lights all the time. Yeah. So just in part response to my colleague, um, I think Holland or Copenhagen are just starting a pioneering idea where you, on the bicycle, you might actually have priority to change the lights in certain times of day um, in your favour, obviously. Yeah, there's two, two answers to that, really. Uh, the first is um, the idea or perception of getting rid of the traffic lights, especially for cyclists, so the, the green wave ideas from Denmark and Copenhagen and those. Um, so effectively removing them from uh, the process by creating a green wave of people going through. Um, but alternatively, uh, the development of like, segregated cycleways in particular mean that uh, people can start to get across a road quite easily. You get over the cycle path, get over the first bit to a middle junction, or go across. Um, I think the, the fact that we've got large roads which don't have any island between them or don't have any segregation um, is one of the reasons why there are more and more traffic lights around the place. That's my belief. Yeah, but otherwise, I feel... I spoke to a, sorry, I spoke to a highways engineer a while ago and I asked a question and they said, because the, it's all about flow and it's all about controlling flow, which I thought was a very strange answer because it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> yeah, and with potential like, left turns at, um, through traffic lights or straight-ons at T-junctions and things, especially for bikes or at certain times of the day. Um, yeah, that could be positive. Thanks. Um, uh, my question actually was about the role of the private car, in a sense, because in Copenhagen, uh, which I visited sort of three times in the last 15 years, it does appear to me at the moment as though there is an increase in the use of private cars, particularly in the new suburbs. So quite a lot of sort of parking that's being, that's being created. 
Copenhagen's also a much more sprawling city, in my view, um, than is London. And I really wonder whether one shouldn't be concentrating in London on reducing demand for the private car in order to enable um, b better conditions for cycling. Um, because, yeah, okay, why don't I just leave it like that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, exactly the idea that in the suburbs we should be thinking about connection to local transport hubs. Um, making people perceive that you can get on a bike to start your journey and it doesn't necessarily have to be your whole journey. Um, whereas uh, the idea is that if you're going to take a, undertake a journey, you'd choose one form of transport and then start it, like get in the car to get to somewhere. Um, but if, there, if it became efficient to, to do a multimodal journey and popular to do such a thing, then I think that idea would start to change. And, uh, whereas in Copenhagen, everything's still one or the other. You choose one and that's how you take the transport. There are just a couple of things. There's one is actually, I think what we need to do is make cycling the norm. So where, um, for example, the um, Mini Hollands seem to have quite a good idea, is not just actually getting in, say, to the transport hubs, etc., but get to the schools, get to the supermarkets and connect these things. So actually cycling becomes, you know, the norm. I cycle absolutely everywhere. I don't have a car. I never will buy a car, but I wouldn't let my kids cycle anywhere on the road. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we need carrot and we need a bl sorry, bloody big stick as well because car drivers have got a monopoly. They believe they've got a monopoly and quite frankly, their abuse of my civil liberties and all well, your guys' civil liberties, plus the actual existing rules of the road, are horrendous. Um, I try to occasionally walk my daughter to school, as opposed to cycling. Every single day, there's cars parked across the crossing, well, on the green line. Haringey Council will not uh, prosecute cars who block or park on the pavement. People, people, for example, um, who converted their gardens, their garden is the size of a mini, they will park a Range Rover on there and it will block half the pavement. They will not, the politicians don't do anything about it and they won't do anything. They're too scared of the car lobby. This, need, this needs to be absolutely crushed. We, we, we've got a local councillor speaking next, so I'm sure you can... Uh, <laughs> uh, any, any other comment before... Uh, kind of almost leading on from that is, in your experience, do you see uh, the same kind of, I imagine it's a different thing in developing cities, but the same kind of conflicts, the kind of the cyclist, driver, walker mentality, is there, did you come across any experiences of that anecdotally at all? Uh, yeah, everywhere, um, and it's unavoidable, but there's both the cultural aspect, which you can't necessarily change so quickly, but in terms of, I think this also links to what you were saying. Um, like in Mexico City, they've just put up these, uh, instead of creating completely segregated circle lanes, um, they still have pretty much exactly the same width of uh, painted line on the road. But in that line, they've got these triangular um, stoppers, bumpers, which are just um, horrible if you hit it with your car wheel. And that's just stating that if you're going to go towards a cycle lane, then you're going to like, ruin your tires and we need to protect the cyclists. So it's just like minor, minor details which could start to transform the idea of just feeling safe on a cycle lane. And it's, does, it, does it give a puncture? It doesn't give a puncture, but <laughs> yeah. I guess it, depend, it depends how quickly, fast you hit it. It's different from the armadillo, which people park over. Yeah, there different to those, yeah. Cool. Can I just say, yes, because one interesting about armadillos is that uh, uh, where there was a curve on the side, the cycle motorcycling lobby got so upset about that that now the design has changed slightly, so if they did hit it, it wouldn't hurt them at all, and so they can probably drive over it really easily. Yes, yeah, sorry, my, my name's Charlotte May, I'm, I work at Camden. Um, just wanted to ask about um, 
plan the planners and uh, highway engineers that you spoke to in the various cities, particularly some of those that are experiencing very rapid in, um, economic development, um, did you feel that in some or most cases that they were taking cycling seriously as a, as a mode? Or were they essentially tra planning for motor traffic and kind of doing a bit for cyclists? It's all, yeah, it, it's entirely dependent on how the city uh, uses data, really, whether it's vehicle-based or uh, people-based. And so the cities which are more progressive in terms of use, like understanding and gathering data uh, really understood how to take cycling seriously, but every other one was very much um, vehicle-based. So it was, they were heavily focused on buses, on metro systems, which were far, far more expensive, um, but uh, would then put cycling to one side as if it's uh, not going to create enough change to uh, change the way that people move in the city. So. Great. Well, we should move on now to our, our, our next uh, uh, speaker. And uh, so uh, he's uh, Vincent Stops, who is a, a, a blogger, a, a tweeter, and a counsellor, and somebody who looks at balancing the various pressures we've just been talking about. So, Vincent, Thank you very much. Um, the first decision I made as a counsellor 12 years ago was to take cars off the pavement. On Richmond Road, I had a, um, a, a, a lovely letter from somebody who said, the first time in my life I've been able to walk down that road with my partner. Um, so, that, so there are some um, local um, councillors that are willing to make difficult decisions, and they are really difficult decisions. Um, but I want to spend just a few minutes um, trying to, to frame the argument in a different way, um, as I think I've been asked to. And, and that is to, first of all, to ask you, what is the most important, has been the most important bit of cycling infrastructure in London in the last 15 years? Congestion charging. Congestion charging. Absolutely right. So if you look at any of the, the statistics, you'll see cycling bobbling along and then congestion charging goes up. And so the, the point I'm trying to make is we've got to stop banging on about infrastructure and this, that and the other, we've got to get a bit more sophisticated uh, and start thinking about restraint. If you go to Copenhagen, if you talk to Jan Gale, the world's best urbanist, he will tell you that taking out parking is a, as important as anything else. If you had congestion charging, Peter, you wouldn't need to build these tunnels and these bridges and God knows what else that will bankrupt the nation and do no good. Um, so I th we need a bit more sophistication amongst your visitors, I think. Um, so, um, so the restraint is the most important thing, and thinking about um, other modes is also important. We're a very, very big city, you know, it's eight and a half million going up to ten, and we need to think more about, um, of course, bicycles, cycling, but public transport. Um, what I want to talk about mostly, though, is towards a fine city for people. Yangale came to. London in 2004, Peter will know all about it, told us what we should be doing, um, and one of the most important things is to create a better balance between motor vehicles, cyclists and pedestrians. And frankly, we have forgotten that, and we've careered off in, in, in a direction of, of, of putting curbs down, God knows what streets, in Whitechapel, etc. So the, the sort of um, things that we need to be doing, and, and I want to talk a bit about Hackney and what we've done in Hackney, because I've been asked to. Um, Hackney has more um, cycling community, commuters than, than drive. Um, TfL assessed that 24% of the cycling, cyclable journeys are cycled. That's almost double the closest next one at all. So Hackney's been a really success and we've spent 12 years actually uh, not putting in um, cycle specific infrastructure. We've put in infrastructure, we've improved the road system for cyclists, walkers, public transport. So we've got car free development as well. Restraint is important. Um, 40,000 people moved into Hackney um, in the last dec the decade of the census. There was a drop of 4,000 vehicles. That's because 95% um, of um, pr private new development is car free. So in my ward I represent, there's a 268 um, ha ha unit 
um, block and there are no parking facilities for anybody. So they will all have to get on their bicycles or, or, or the bus or walk, apart from the disabled. Um, I think that needs extending. Why, why we have to have car-free development, it needs to be on top of a station, I don't know. Um, it can be, it's a cyclable distance around elsewhere, and I know that was one of the hundred ideas for housing. So we need to extend car-free development. Um, we need to deal with the parking issues, and they're really difficult. Um, and road closures. Um, one of the great things, Hackney has got 100 streets um, that have a gate at the end of it. So there, there's a huge number of possibilities and gates in the end of one street, and I live happily just down from one, have an area-wide impact. So if you go to Stoke Newington, how many Hackney residents? Okay, you'll know Stoke Newington, um, so you, you'll be able to cycle from uh, Church Street down to, um, well, down to Walls Pond Road without seeing many vehicles. Um, we do need to see huge investment, and that's in the public realm. Um, in Hackney, we, we, we started um, with Shoreditch High Street, Dalston, Stoke Newington, um, Church Street, Broadway Market, Hackney Central, um, the, the narrow way, the mother of all road closures, the narrow way was closed to buses, it was much better. Leonard Circus, did you get hit by that um, bicycle on the film there? <laughs> it was close, wasn't it? Peter, Peter loves Leonard Circus. And bus priority, we can't forget bus priority in this argument. Um, the, the, the bus has, meant, has delivered huge drops in the use of, of cars uh, and, and that, that will benefit um, the pedestrian. Medium schemes, we've got Pitfield Street, Goldsmith Row, Westgate Street, Sandringham Road, a load of them that you would hardly think of as a cycling scheme and they aren't cycling schemes, they're public realm schemes that slow the traffic down, take out capacity and allow the cyclist, the pedestrian to benefit. And then we've got thousands of other interventions. So we've put in um, proper paving in the streets, quality material, we've widened pavements, we've taken out the guard railing, Yang Gao told us to do that, and almost no authority has, has gone in and taken out the guard railing apart from Kensington and, and Hackney. Um, junction protection, you need yellow lines around junctions so, so your children will be able to cycle. Um, you need a zero tolerance on a board. Do you know it's illegal to put an advertising board on the footway and in every single borough bar about two or three it is ignored. Some boroughs defend the rights of the um, obstructor to obstruct. That needs to stop. Um, drop curbs, there's still drop curbs that aren't there. 20 mile an hour zones, bus priority, speed tables. Where are we? And, and the last thing is, is this, this 100 road closures. So what I'm saying is, is, is that we need to think um, more creatively in the round about improving London for people, getting, creating a better balance between pedestrians and cyclists, not just be fixated with curbs and infrastructure, and, which you know, it's going to take us 100 years to do that sort of stuff. You know? we, we, we need to be a bit more um, savvy. Thank you. Don't go away because it's now uh, Q&A time, but um, could I, uh, well, to raise your point about uh, congestion charge, actually that what we've seen is quite a good uh, result in terms of saying yes to uh, road uh, uh, charging. And I, won't, if we do road charging properly, won't that solve so many issues in terms of both numbers of cars coming in, but uh, uh, all sorts of other elements about timing of traffic and all sorts of other things. Absolutely. Like that. It is the, the you may come up to the microphone. Here we, here. It is the single biggest, um, uh, most important issue that we need to get over at the mayoral elections. Will you put in wider um, congestion charging? Without it, we're wasting our time, really, because if, we, if we, everybody gets on a bicycle, there's so much latent demand that we'll just fill the gaps with folks that see the opportunity to drive. And as a politician, do you see that changing? I mean, the road charging was a toxic uh, point, yeah. wasn't it, for yeah. quite a long time? But I, one feels it's getting more accepted. Really it? difficult. That's why we've got to keep saying it. And it's got to come not from transport people, but from business and other folks that say, you know, we can't have our vehicles sitting around all day. Yeah, good. Anyone else like to raise a point? 
Hi. A uh, question about road closures. I mean, it can be hugely controversial with a lot of acrimony between, you know, literally neighbour to neighbour. Is there any way to make the process easier, or is it just got to accept there's going to be a big fight? Well, I think, I think it needs to be done opportunistically. If you go out, part of the problem is drawing a line, and we've seen this over the years, and saying, right, that's a cycle route, we want to close bits of roads along it. It will not be coincidental with the fact of, you know, a particular neighbourhood being very keen on having their road closed. So, um, what I'm saying is, is some communities want it and you need to get in there and close those roads. Some communities won't and I guess you've got to walk away from them until they get fed up with the traffic and, and go back. So, I mean, the, the road closures that happened in Hackney, and some of them are to stop prostitution, you know? So it's not all about, not all about transport planning and it's not all rational. It's, it's just happened because various communities have wanted it and, um, you know, some... Our MP says, you know, she can cycle across the whole borough um, without seeing a car. And that's because there are just so many of them. Um, something that nobody's mentioned, it's not on your options of uh, getting here today, uh, the toxic taxi. Um, they've grown in numbers enormously in the last few years. And it's sort of the elephant in the room, I think. I think you're talking about private hire vehicles. Yes, they right. have grown. The elephant in the room is the private vehicle, you know? Let's get away from thinking it's the bus that's the problem. It's not the bus the problem. It's not, the, to some degree, the black cab honeypots too much. There is a problem with the Uber thing, and they will honeypot, and somebody's got a congestion charge them off the road. Um, but the problem is the private vehicle. Well, we're just about getting up to oh. time, so uh, uh, I'd like to thank our, our, our speakers, uh, interesting points, which some of those are actually raised in this exhibition. This exhibition is very much about uh, raising a number of points from sort of that bit of the exhibition onwards. These are changes which will be happening uh, to London streets. Uh, uh, some of them will be, some of them we hope will be changing. Uh, but uh, we need this sort of debate, continuing discussion, and also making these points to uh, uh, politicians who maybe aren't as listening as uh, much as Vincent is, and particularly to uh, mayoral candidates who, of course, are going to hopefully continue on uh, some of the good things that uh, Boris Johnson's been doing for cycling, but uh, hopefully do even more. So uh, thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoyed that talk and enjoy the exhibition as well. Thank you.